Good morning and welcome, everybody. We're obviously very pleased to have this uh, terrific turnout, and it shows the uh, high level of interest in our, in our subject today and the drawing power of uh, Secretary Baker and all the people he brought together to try to bring peace to the Middle East, something that, as we all know, is a, a continuing challenge. But today we are focusing on the Madrid conference of 20 years ago, trying to uh, look at what it accomplished uh, and what has happened ever since, and to see whether there are any lessons to be learned that can be applied to uh, the continuing struggle to find, find peace in the Middle East. I should note that this is the second opportunity that the Institute of Peace has had to work with the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy affiliated with, with uh, Rice University. Some of you uh, may have heard of the Iraq Study Group. Uh, the Baker Institute, Secretary Baker, uh, played a major leading role in that effort. And so today, the chance to collaborate again is something we, we very much, very much welcome. Let me just uh, comment that on behalf of the Institute that uh, work on the Middle East peace process has been an ongoing uh, concern, actually starting with our first president, Ambassador Sam Lewis, who is with us today. He and Ken Stein, uh, shortly after the Institute was established, uh, did a look and an analysis of uh, the peace process, actually beginning with uh, the results or the outcome of the Six-Day War through Camp David, trying to figure out lessons learned there that <coughs> might carry the process forward. And today, with the leadership of uh, former National Security Advisor Sandy Berger and Steve Hadley, uh, we've had a senior working group trying to come up with uh, perspectives on how to restart the peace process. And uh, we also have people on the ground, uh, whether Iraq, Afghanistan, or right now in the Maghreb, uh, in Libya, trying to uh, nurse along the uh, transitions that are still very much underway uh, as a result of the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening, however one would want to characterize it. So what's going on in the Middle East has been a, an ongoing preoccupation of this institute as it is with the, the Baker Institute. It's a particular pleasure to uh, welcome here to our, our new headquarters. Had we convened this uh, meeting, uh, let's say, a year ago, uh, we would have been downtown in a rather undistinguished piece of architecture, the National Restaurant Association building. But obviously the ability to work here uh, at the northwest corner of the National Mall within sight of all the war memorials is part of our uh, inspiration to try to work on the issues of conflict management and peace building. Today's uh, session is in very much, uh, as we saw over a uh, a, br a breakfast gathering a minute ago, a kind of reunion for all of the diplomats who under Secretary Baker's leadership uh, had brought uh, Madrid together and who continue to work on this seemingly uh, intractable conflict. And uh, their perspectives, which will be shared with us during the day, are very much of the part of our effort, again, to draw lessons learned and to see whether there's an opportunity to move, restart and move forward Arab-Israeli really peacemaking. So with that as a welcome, let me uh, ask uh, Ambassador Ed Jerigian, the founding president of the Baker Center, to uh, our co-host uh, to uh, come to the podium. Ed. Thank you very much, Dick. He just promoted me to president. I'm just the founding director, so. <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be here in USIP's new and beautiful building and to co-host this event uh, with our colleagues in USIP. This is proving to be a now a long-standing and excellent collaboration between our two public policy institutes. Uh, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, we are marking 20 years since the Madrid Peace Conference of 1991, which launched the first comprehensive direct negotiations between Israel and its Arab neighbors, and provided the framework for comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace on all fronts. 
It was a watershed moment for American diplomacy. While the historic context is different than in the early 1990s, policymakers today face equally daunting challenges in the region which pose both dangers and opportunities. It is timely, therefore, to draw lessons from the achievement of Madrid and explore new ideas for dealing with the present and future challenges facing the Middle East region, which is the subject of today's conference under the aegis of the United States Institute for Peace and the Baker Institute for Public Policy. Uh, today, we will look at the lessons of Madrid over the past 20 years and consider how we might move forward. As you can see in your program, we will hear from distinguished leaders, diplomats, eminent scholars, and noted uh, journalists. In particular, I would like to recognize the Honorable James A. Baker III, the 61st United States Secretary of State, who, would, who with President George Herbert Walker Bush were the architects of the Madrid Conference. At our concluding session, two former national security advisors, Zbigniew Brzezinski and Steve Hadley, will address Arab-Israeli peacemaking and the changing Middle East. Unfortunately, our distinguished luncheon speaker, Deputy Secretary of State William Burns, is unable to be with us uh, <clears throat> for, as our luncheon speaker. Uh, Bill called me from the airport yesterday. Secretary Clinton had asked him to go to Istanbul uh, to represent her uh, at this very important conference on Afghanistan. As we all know, Secretary Clinton's mother passed away, so Bill is uh, in Istanbul, but he did express to me his deep apologies and regrets that he cannot be with us today. Uh, being fast on our feet, Dick Solomon, uh, his team, and I were going to have a little anecdotal panel to uh, fill Bill's slot. Uh, we've asked Sam Lewis to uh, moderate a panel of the, uh, some of the Americans who were at Madrid, the so-called peace processes, the Madrid junkies. Uh, that will be Aaron Miller, uh, Dan Kurtzer, and uh, Gamal, uh, who will uh, give anecdotes about how Madrid was put together. I think that will be uh, of, of uh, great interest. Our deliberations today will encompass many important issues. Some of these include the impact of U.S. diplomacy in the Middle East at a time of geopolitical change, the unfolding story of the Arab awakening and its regional impact, the territorial and security issues in Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, and the economics of peace building, including the role of business and development assistance. We will also examine prospects for Israeli-Palestinian relations and peacemaking in the wake of the recent Palestinian initiatives in the United Nations, as well as the role of public opinion on peace negotiations and the ominous situation in Syria. As we discuss the prospects for Arab-Israeli peace, we have to take into consideration the rich legacy of peace negotiations. Much work has been done. Indeed, the overall contours of an Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution have been on the negotiating table for years now. At the Baker Institute, we produced a report in 2010 entitled Getting to the Territorial Endgame of an Israeli-Palestinian Settlement that we have provided to the negotiating parties. The reason I mention that report is that it demonstrated through track two diplomacy of bringing Israelis and Palestinians together with an American role that with U.S. assistance, hard compromises between Israelis and Palestinians can be achieved on the key issues of borders, Israeli settlements, and land swaps. This report is available on our webpage. The point is that these issues can be resolved with the necessary determination and political will of the parties. That, indeed, is the question, question of leadership. Hopefully, in our deliberations today, we can identify ways to make progress towards direct peace talks in the near, near future. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you for your participation in our conference. Now, I invite you to view the video screen uh, for a recent interview I did with President George Herbert Walker Bush, who, with Secretary Baker, are the architects of the Madrid <clears throat> Peace Conference. He gives us his perspective on Madrid.
Mr. President, uh, among the many achievements of your administration in foreign policy was the convening of the Madrid Peace Conference on October 30th, 1991. We're truly honored uh, that you are with us here today to commemorate the 20th anniversary of that historic event, the first time in over 40 years that the Israelis and the Arabs sat down in face-to-face -face direct negotiations to try to come to a comprehensive peace settlement. What was your strategic calculus uh, in taking this a bold initiative? Well, the political landscape had dramatically changed, uh, largely due to the fall of the Berlin Wall, unification of Germany, uh, and our building a strong coalition, including Arab states, before a desert storm. Uh, at the same time, while he was facing momentous challenges at home, President Gorbachev demonstrated his intent to engage the Soviet Union as a force for positive change in the Middle East. This sent a signal, powerful signal actually, to all those who longed for peace, and we decided to take advantage uh, of this historic moment. Secretary of State Jim Baker and I launched an intensive diplomatic effort that culminated in the Madrid Peace Conference. Mr. President, what, what were your expectations when you opened up the Madrid Peace Conference? Well, as I said at the time that we had come to Madrid on a mission of hope to begin work on a just, lasting, and comprehensive settlement to the conflict in the Middle East, it was a clear opportunity that we had to be realistic. Uh, peace could only come as a result of direct negotiations, compromise, give and take, and, and we demonstrated that the United States could take the lead and be an honest broker. Uh, we made it clear that we would do everything possible to help the parties overcome obstacles. Well, Mr. President, what, what do you see in retrospect now as the major accomplishment of Madrid? Well, Madrid laid out the framework for comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace. peace. It, fa it facilitated the direct negotiations between Israel and Jordan uh, that culminated in a peace treaty in 1994 uh, between those two countries. And unfortunately, the momentum has been lost despite the best efforts of subsequent uh, administrations to reach peace agreements between Israel and the Palestinians and Syria and Lebanon. What do you think, Mr. President, needs to be done now? Well, now, to succeed, we must recognize that the peace is in the interest of all parties, right. and that war is in the absolute advantage of none. The alternative to peace in the Middle East is a uh, future of violence and waste and tragedy. And in any future war lurks the danger of weapons of mass destruction. All the parties should consider taking measures that will bolster mutual confidence and trust, steps that signal a, a sincere commitment to reconciliation. Any final thoughts, Mr. President, you wish to convey to our conference uh, participants on the 20th anniversary of Madrid? Well, as I said at the time, success will escape us if the parties focus solely upon what is being given up. Uh, we must fix our vision on what real peace could bring. The Middle East is blessed with great resources, physical, financial, and yes, above all, human. Uh, new opportunities are within reach. If we only have the vision to embrace them, it's my fervent hope that the promise of Madrid will be feel, fulfilled sooner rather than later. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It's now my uh, personal pleasure to uh, introduce our 61st Secretary of State, uh, James A. Baker III. I had the privilege of working for Secretary Baker on East Asian issues while he was focused on Madrid and many other issues further, further west. Uh, he let me alone to worry with issues like Cambodia while uh, he was dealing with the really big issues, and of course, that will be our focus, focus today. <clears throat> when you go into public office, you really never know what the muse of history is going to put on your agenda. 
But in the case of uh, Secretary Baker and the Bush <coughs> 41 administration, some of the really major uh, earth-shaking events of this century occurred. And of course, there was brief mention of it a minute ago, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the reunification of Germany, and then the Gulf War of 1991. And uh, Secretary Baker, the administration then faced the issue of all right, what to do about the simmering Israeli-Palestinian problem. And uh, I want to read you a couple of quotes from uh, Secretary Baker's massive but actually riveting memoir, uh, The Politics of Diplomacy, on, on that issue. And he wrote, all secretaries of state are inevitably sucked into the Middle East, where they expend an inordinate amount of time and effort in an, in an enterprise with few prospects for success and an enormous potential for disappointment. And then he added that I, Secretary Baker, frankly saw the Arab-Israeli dispute as a pitfall to be avoided rather than an opportunity to be exploited. Now that perspective uh, seemed to have changed, as I'm sure we'll hear, following the Gulf War. And uh, to jump ahead of all the intervening events that led to the success of Madrid, uh, Secretary Baker was able to look back on that enterprise and say the following. By every reasonable barometer, Madrid was a resounding triumph. Its enduring legacy was simply that it happened at all. After 43 years of bloody conflict, the ancient taboo against Arabs talking to Israelis had, in the space of one carefully choreographed hour, been dramatically consigned to the backbenches of history. Unfortunately, those backbenches are still there, and given the current state of uh, Arab-Israeli relations and the situation in the Middle East, uh, one has to wonder who's sitting on those backbenches uh, today. But it's in that context that we're very privileged and uh, delighted to have Secretary Baker with us and to uh, help us draw the conclusions of the Madrid effort and see what they can lead us to in terms of hopefully more progress in the future. Secretary Baker. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Ambassador Solomon, for that a very generous uh, introduction, and uh, just by way of uh, comment, uh, Dick was focused on Cambodia, as he mentioned to you, but guess what? We got a peace agreement in Cambodia, thanks to Dick's efforts, while we were uh, spinning around in the Middle East working on minor matters, right, Dick? <laughs> Madrid happened on the, uh, on the 30th of October, 1991, and as you heard President Bush say in his remarks, it really was a time of historic change around the world. The Berlin Wall had fallen, Germany had been unified as a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, an unprecedented international coalition had ejected Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait. And although we didn't know it at the time of Madrid, the Soviet Union itself would very shortly cease to exist. And had anyone told me three years prior to Madrid, when I first became Secretary of State, that I might play a role in bringing together Israel and all of its Arab neighbors for peace talks, my reaction, as Dick has read to you from my uh, memoir, Politics of Diplomacy, would have been one of great skepticism. Because from the start of my job at Foggy Bottom, the last thing in the world I wanted to do was get near the Middle East peace process. <laughs> Uh, there, there were many, as I just mentioned, many historic opportunities in other parts of the world, and I saw that Arab-Israeli dispute as a pitfall to be, devoid, to be avoided at all costs, if possible. And if my own instincts were not enough to guide me in that regard, I had gone around before taking office as Secretary of State, and I talked to all the former Secretaries of State who had served, and I talked to many former Presidents, and every one of them said, stay away from that conflict. Everybody who touches it gets burned. So I came into office saying one thing I wasn't going to get involved in was Middle East peace. I did recognize that uh, this was a vital uh, region as far as American national interests were concerned. I recognized it was a perpetual tinderbox. 
uh, whose seemingly constant crisis had invariably demanded the attention of my predecessors. But face-to-face -face negotiations between Arabs and Israelis at that time really did seem far-fetched. Maybe not quite as far-fetched <laughs> as they seem today. But as events unfolded around the world, we sought uh, in, in, at the State Department to manage the, the delicate and dangerous relationships in the Middle East with what I would say at best would be called a modestly activist policy. And we did so with very, very little success. But a new dynamic had become apparent by March 9, 1991. We had a breakfast uh, earlier this morning with a lot of the people who worked on Madrid and one of the participants said he remembered a meeting in Houston, Texas uh, in March of 91 where President Bush and I were uh, in attendance and we had some of the peace process people with us. And we uh, at that time recognized, this is now about three weeks after the end of Desert Storm, that there might be some potential here. And I think I first recognized that as I flew over the, uh, the Ku Kuwaiti desert with those oil wells, uh, Skip, you remember that, Skip Ganim was our ambassador then, that uh, Saddam Hussein had set on fire, uh, flaming uh, in, in, the, uh, in the desert sky. Uh, Iraq's retreat in the first Gulf War, I think, coupled with America's emergence as the preeminent global superpower at that time, had changed things and had changed things significantly. By defeating that fourth largest army in the world, the United States had simultaneously enhanced Israel's security and strengthened the hand of moderate Arab states like Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, who now had an even greater respect and gratitude for us. At the same time, the Soviet Union, who had long been a source of patronage for Arab rejectionism, had supported in that desert storm in the first Gulf War supported actively what the United States had done. Didn't send troops, but voted for our use of force resolution in the Security Council. So in short, events had taken place that we thought might make it possible for us to unlock the diplomatic gates that had blocked Middle East peace for decades. Our power, America's power that is, and street credibility at the time were unmatched. Perhaps we said to ourselves there was an opportunity now to do some of the things that had not been possible before. And so, as President Bush just indicated to you, we launched a, a major effort to bring Arabs and Israelis together in direct face-to-face -face negotiations. Our goal was as simple in theory, frankly, as it would be difficult to accomplish in practice. We wanted, if we could do nothing else, to break the historic taboo against face-to-face -face talks in the hopes that that might lead us somehow to a comprehensive settlement between Israel and the Palestinians and between Israel and all of its Arab neighbors. And so we propose direct talks between Arabs and Israelis in the form of a regional conference that was to be co-sponsored by the United States and the Soviet Union something that a year or two earlier would have been unheard of. All parties would be represented. We understood that determining the question of who would represent the Palestinians might be the most difficult hurdle we would have to clear. The other major hurdle, of course, would be getting the Arab states, particularly Syria and Saudi Arabia, to change 40 years of policy. 40 years of policy and agree to meet face to face with Israel. For Syria and Saudi Arabia to do that would be tantamount to their recognizing Israel's right to exist, something that those two and other Arab states at that time had been unwilling to do. Now the concept of a regional conference was an exercise in creative ambiguity. The Arabs could claim it was the, inter the international conference that they had long sought. Similarly, the Israelis could contend that it was really nothing more than the face-to-face -face discussions that they had said they desired for more than 40 years. There, of course, were a lot of midwives of Madrid. It wasn't just the United States. 
We had tremendous help from Saudi King Fahd, Egyptian President Mubarak, Jordan's King Hussein, and, and Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Shamir, although he was not too, totally enthusiastic about Madrid, he did show up, and he deserves some credit for that and for something else I'm, I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But one of the most intense periods of diplomacy focused on Damascus and on Syrian President Assad. A key moment there came in the spring of 1991 when I gave Assad's foreign minister a letter from President Bush inviting the Syrian government into direct negotiations with Israel, but I accompanied it, we accompanied it, with a letter of assurances from the United States to both Israel and Syria. That same letter of invitation and similar letters of assurance went to Jordan, to Lebanon, and to the Palestinians. After further negotiations with Assad over a period of weeks, and after, as Ed DeRigian will remember, one very notable double cross by him, which almost blew the whole thing up, he finally agreed on July 14 that Syria would come to Madrid. We checked his response. I, I didn't believe it when I was told about it over the telephone. In fact, I was so, uh, so uncertain that I went out and said, our ambassador in Damascus has informed me that President Assad has said, <laughs> so that if it didn't turn out to be true, it was the regions. <laughs> but it turned out that his response was the real thing. There was no catch. Syria would abandon a policy that she had held since, followed since 1948 and sit down across the table with Israel. So that development, that new position was a key development in reciprocal confidence building. We then exploited his participation to cajole other Arab states that they should not only follow suit, but that they themselves should make new gestures to Israel. Armed with fresh signs of Arab commitment, we could confidently then tell Shamir that the Arab countries were indeed willing to engage in direct negotiations. Shamir, of course, was a hardline Israeli prime minister, a Likud leader, who once said that Benjamin Netanyahu was too soft. <laughs> I mention that because that's the type of Israeli leader we were dealing with. But I have to say this about Shamir. Shamir's word was good. I don't think we agreed my, on much uh, in the, on the policy front, but personally, I got along very, very well with him and he with me, and we respected each other. And I will tell you that I never found, never had an instance in which Shamir, Shamir told me something that didn't turn out to be true, where he welched on his word or anything like that, and never an instance in which he leaked something that I told him in confidence. Anyway, after much negotiation and tens of thousands of miles of uh, shuttle diplomacy, our Original instincts proved correct, and uh, Madrid became a framework for direct negotiations for the first time then since Camp David and the Israel-Egyptian uh, peace treaty. No matter what justification after that each side wanted to summon up in order to explain why there couldn't be peace, the one excuse they could no longer use was that there was nobody at the other end of the table to talk to. Madrid, I think, revealed the absolute critical importance of the United States as a credible and effective broker. We were reassuring, but we were also tough. We were reassuring, but we were also fair. We never made threats or promises that we were not prepared to carry out. And there was a cost imposed upon the parties for willfully saying no. But as Dick said in his quote from my book about my four years as Secretary of State, I think Madrid's enduring legacy is simply that it happened at all. Uh, like the walls of Jericho, those ancient prohibitions against Arabs talking with Israelis came tumbling down. Madrid also allowed Saudi Arabia and other Arab states to participate in the peace process through multilateral negotiations on a number of regional issues. Within three years, Israel had signed the Oslo Accords with Palestinians and a peace treaty with Jordan. Sadly, of course, 
The chances for peace in the region have since regressed to the point that today the parties are again unwilling to even meet to talk about peace. There's no useful purpose in pointing figures, uh, fingers about the responsibility for that situation. There are plenty of people bear responsibility, plenty of countries bear responsibility. It happens to be a reality uh, and, and a fact. In the meantime, the Arab awakening has the potential to rearrange the political and social landscape in the Middle East in what I think are going to be some very unpredictable, which, which are very, some very unpredictable ways as we sit here today. Increasingly, I think the opinion of uh, people in the street is going to play a role in the calculus of foreign policy by Arab leaders. That's going to make it harder for them to sit down to engage in peace talks with Israel. In the medium to long term, the Arab awakening should benefit the region, particularly if it leads to the spread of democracy and human rights and economic stability and social justice, which of course is what we hope will happen. But I have to tell you, I think the short-term prospects may be quite problematic. Uncertainties, after all, abound today in Syria, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in Yemen, and in Bahrain. And in a region as interconnected as the Middle East, problems in one country can easily spread, spelling trouble for peacemaking and democracy building. Compounding, of course, all of this is the specter of extremist terrorism. Although Al-Qaeda is on the defensive, its contractors continue to operate and pose a threat to stability in the Middle East. And as a result, I think our country has to carefully balance its, interest in, 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 its interests in regard to the Arab awakening and do so on a case-by-case -case and country-by-country -country basis. In many ways, of course, we have come full circle now since 1989 when I became Secretary of State and had hoped to avoid the Arab-Israeli dispute. However, I think the good news is that a heck of a lot of work has been done since Madrid on big issues such as territory and security and Palestinian refugees, Jerusalem, and the normalization of relations with Israel. And the general outline of an Israeli-Palestinian two-state solution I think is reasonably clear to most people. Still, we are very, very far from an agreement. And in fact, things are look, look as bleak today, in my view, uh, as they did before Madrid. Peace, the peace process may not be dead, but it is clearly on life support. It lacks two important ingredients, in my view, leadership. We talked about this at breakfast and will, political will. Particularly in the case of leadership and political will, I regret to say, on the part of the United States of America. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not a political comment because that lead lack of leadership and will has occurred in both Republican and Democratic administrations. There is really a pressing need today to kickstart the peace process before time runs out on a two-state solution, which remains, in my view, the only rational approach to ending this costly and dangerous conflict. The window for a two-state solution continues to narrow as settlers keep moving into the occupied territories. With each new settler, it becomes harder and harder for the Israeli government to make the compromise needed for peace. Correspondingly, Palestinian frustrations mount, increasing the influence of Hamas and even more radical organizations. Successive U.S. administrations have engaged the parties without being, to, being able to arrive at a final settlement. After years of stalemated negotiations and ever-increasing settlement activity, the Palestinians have now turned to the United Nations in an attempt to level the playing field by enhancing their diplomatic and legal standing vis-a-vis -vis Israel. But I happen to believe 
ladies and gentlemen, that you only get peace, a real peace, by negotiating it. And a two-state solution has to be negotiated as well. At this point, let me digress a moment to talk a bit about the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Because that relationship is obviously critical to the achievement of peace between Israelis and Palestinians, as well as other Arab states. Our relationship with Israel today is unshakable, whether we are governed by Republicans or Democrats, and it's going to remain so. The United States will always be Israel's best friend, and we will always be totally committed to Israel's security. Furthermore, even beyond those historic and unbreakable ties between the two countries, it is in America's interest to support a like-minded democracy in a region that is undergoing massive change. However, sometimes in our relationship with Israel, there are tensions. Everybody out there who's worked on this problem knows that. There are tensions, there are disputes, there are differences, many of them not unlike family arguments. Whenever those quarrels occur, however, it is important that they be resolved in a productive way. Within the context of our close relationship with Israel, we owe Israel and ourselves the obligation of speaking openly and honestly and directly. We must say what we mean, and we must mean what we say. That candor is what happened during the lead up to Madrid. It helped make Madrid possible, and it has to happen today and in the future. And in speaking honestly and openly, we should make it clear that while the United States cannot deliver Israel to a peace agreement, the only way Israel, or for that matter the Palestinians, will achieve peace is to negotiate it. And in the long run, it is critical for Israel particularly to do this because there is no other way for her to maintain both her democratic and her Jewish character. Yes, it is critical that we not allow the two-state solution to expire, but we also need to be realistic and we need to be pragmatic about the chances of achieving it right now. In my opinion, nothing much is gonna happen between now and the 2012 election in this country. Domestic politics happens to be a reality and that applies to both Democrats and Republicans. In my view, there's no chance of a breakthrough on the Arab-Israeli peace process in the coming year. And frankly, that may not be all bad, because the last thing we need now is another failure. One lesson of Madrid is that the time has to be ripe in the, for any success in the Arab-Israeli dispute. And just getting past the coming U.S. presidential election is probably not enough alone for creating the proper environment. In addition, the Palestinians must be united in supporting negotiations for peace. That means one set of security services, one negotiating position, and one authority. Furthermore, the Israeli government must be one that is prepared to lean forward for peace, as Itzhak Rabin was. The current Israeli government, I'm sad to say, fails that test. And so fixing the Hamas Fatah problem among the Palestinians and the emergence of an Israeli government that leans forward for peace are two other things that will have to happen, in my view, before any real progress can be made. Having said that, there are things that can be worked on now so as to prevent the situation from deteriorating. I think there are three goals that the United States should promote until the time is ripe for a bigger deal. First of all, we need to work to do whatever we can to keep Gaza calm, perhaps in, and perhaps in the wake of the release of Gilad, uh, Gilad Shalit, we need to work with the Israelis to open it up, get them to open it up. 
But above all, it is important that we do everything possible that we can do to help keep the ceasefire there in place. Secondly, we need to make sure that Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation continues at the same time that we promote Palestinian institution building and economic development. And third, we must work to maintain the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. Should that peace agreement blow up, you can forget about any Israeli-Palestinian agreement. Eventually, of course, the United States must aggressively lead, I want to emphasize aggressively, lead a push for a process that can move the parties to a two-state solution. So you say, okay, how do we do that? Well, when the conditions are right, and I've outlined three, get past our elections, find a unified uh, Palestine, find a way to get to a unified Palestinian polity, and get a new government Israel that really wants to lean forward for peace. When those conditions are right, the President of the United States needs to invite the Prime Minister of Israel and the leader of a unified Palestinian polity to Washington, D.C. The United States should then put forward its own proposal outlining the framework or general contours of a final status Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement directly linked to a detailed timeline for negotiations on key issues. The framework should comprehensively and objectively spell out the legitimate interests of both sides. In formulating that framework, the concept of Madrid remains valid in my view. That is, direct face-to-face -face negotiations based on the principle of land for peace and UN Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. If bold action such as this is not taken at the right time, we may not have many other windows of opportunity. We may not get that window of opportunity, but I'm very hopeful that we will, and I think we will. But if bold action such as that is not taken at the right time, I fear that the Arab awakening, or as some call it, the Arab spring, may degenerate into an Arab winter, particularly if popular uprisings shift Arab attention from domestic issues to the Palestinian cause. Should that happen, Israel's isolation inside the region and outside would increase, and the United States would shoulder some of the blame. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, by, first of all, by thanking all of you for being here, but secondly, by saying that we all know that the United States cannot create peace in the, in the Middle East. We can't wave a wand and create peace. Only Arabs and Israelis can do that. Uh, our role is to help them, and in doing so, though, we won't help them unless we're hands-on, and unless we're aggressive about it, and unless we're willing to say things, the things we believe and mean the things we say. We are approaching another critical time, just as we were, in my view, in 1991. At that time, we seized the opportunities that Providence presented to us. Our task now, if I may suggest it, is to demonstrate similar imagination, initiative, and most of all, political will and determination. The past shows that we can succeed, and the future will judge us very harshly if we fail. Thank you all very, very much. Paul, what's the uh, modalities here at USIP? This is... Okay, if you just raise your hand and... Uh... Good morning. We're delighted you're here. Thanks so much for your remarks. I'm Rebecca de Guzman, a civilian who works for the Marine Corps. Right here, sir. You said um, the general outline of a two-state solution is clear to most people. Would you indulge us by just outlining some of that for us? Well, I think if you go back and look at, uh, at Camp David, uh, the President Clinton uh, 
the proposals that they were working on at that time. Uh, and I don't have them all in, in my head here, but, but they covered all of the various aspects, the, the security, the refugees, Jerusalem, and so forth. And I think if you look at that, 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 that is, is a pretty good general outline of what the ultimate two-state solution is going to look like. It will also involve uh, some switching of territory to accommodate the, the, uh, the Israeli settlements that are close into Jerusalem that are clearly not going to be dismantled, but that the, the Palestinians will be provided with uh, an equal uh, amount of ter territory, and there'll be some questions about value in that that can be negotiated. But I think the general outlines are reasonably uh, uh, well known. Uh, I refer you to the Baker Institute report that Ed Deridgian mentioned in terms of boundaries. Um, we did a, we, we had an Israeli-Palestinian working group that came up with a lot of uh, good material on the question of boundaries. And and I think, what was the percentage, Ed? That, that uh, we were able to uh, narrow the differences between the Israelis and the Palestinians. They each each party came to the table. The Israelis said. Not going to give up more than 7.03 percent of the West Bank. The Palestinians said no, not more than 1.9 percent, and we narrowed it down to very tough one year and a half uh, to between 3.4 and 4.4 percent. And this was an academic exercise that uh, the Baker Institute. We had uh, Yair Hirschfeld and uh, Sami Abed and our group with distinguished uh, Israelis, high level, and uh, Palestinians, but. The, the the bottom line of all of that was that with, with strong determination, as Secretary Baker has said, the parties, the differences can be narrowed to a range where a settlement is possible. Let me say one thing. Uh, th this will be controversial, and that's okay, because I've been controversial in, in, in the past, and, and now I'm an ex, and I find it's wonderful. You can go out there and say anything you want. I, I don't understand. What I can't understand is how the United States can oppose settlement activity for 30 or 40 years and then veto a resolution that says settlement activity is bad. I mean, we did. We just finished doing that. Uh, that's one good way not to make any progress. Yes. Who, who's next? Uh, the gentleman here. Go ahead, stand up there. Thank you, sir. Uh, Raith al Omari from the American Task Force in Palestine. You mentioned the need for uh, continuing and strengthening the security cooperation and institution building. What role do you think the U.S. has uh, to play in this uh, regard, particularly in light of the calls that we are hearing now for defunding the PA? And are there ways of turning this project from purely a development-oriented project to a political project? Thank you. I, well, I, from discussions I had this morning, I know that the current administration is up on the hill right now talking about uh, not defunding the, the PA uh, as a consequence of what happened in UNESCO. That's short-sighted action that, that uh, many in Congress are demanding. But that, that's an, also another good example of the kind of political will and leadership I'm talking about. You have got to fight that uh, kind of thing where it moves us in the, in the other direction, in a direction away from peace. We need to do whatever we can to strengthen the, the, uh, the moderate voices in the region, whether they're in uh, Israeli citizens, whether they're members of the uh, Palestinian uh, polity or whoever else it is, and not, and not take actions that uh, embolden and strengthen the radicals. Shibli Telhani. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just you, you said that uh, it's unlikely that we will have any real breakthrough with this Israeli government, so you have to wait until there is a, a next government. Is the U.S. a passive player in that? What if it doesn't happen? Uh, there are a lot of people who looked at your tenure and said that the uh, Shamir's losing the elections in Israel had something to do with what the U.S. did or didn't do. Do you see the U.S.? No, it had something to do with what Shamir did or didn't do. <laughs> when, when, when we said, look, he wanted $10 billion in loan guarantees in addition to what we give, gave him every year, uh, 
And we said, we don't think we can do that for you, Prime Minister, unless you're going to give us some assurances that the money's not going to be used for settlement building. He said, well, we, the people in Congress tell me I'm going to get it anyway. And my friends here in Washington tell me I'm going to get it anyway. We said, well, fine, we'll see you on Capitol Hill. And we did, and we won. And that's what cost him the election, not the fact that, that we did something. I mean, we, 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 we stood up for our principles. We said what we meant and meant what we said. That's what I'm talking about. And it's not just with Israel. Uh, the, the, you'll hear some, there'll be some panels this afternoon, I hope, that'll get into some of the ane anecdotal material about wh how we got to Madrid. Uh, and, uh, and I see... Uh, I see I-10, uh, well, I see uh, uh, Gamal Halal here. Gamal was, uh, was the interpreter in these meetings. We were equally tough, believe you me, on the Arabs. And that's what we need to do if we expect to try to midwife uh, a peace. And it's really in our interest to see peace between Arabs and Israelis. Now, I interrupted you. You were going to have something else to say. Well, you, you, along the lines that you suggested, but the, the bottom line is, do you think that this administration or the next administration, what they do will have something to do with whether or not the Israeli government, the current Israeli government, will be in office? I think, yes, I think, here's what I think. I don't think any Israeli prime minister can succeed unless he can be seen to be properly managing the Israeli-U.S. relationship. And I think that's what ended up getting Shamir. And I've already told you that my personal relationship with Shamir was extraordinarily good and strong. Not policy, but personally. But I think that uh, the Israeli body politic felt that he had mishandled the, mismanaged the relationship with the United States. And no Israeli prime minister survives that. Thank now, you what, very we'll much, Mr. We'll see what sir. might happen. I don't, I'm not in a position to predict it, what might happen, if, particularly if uh, President Obama is reelected. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary.